Joining me now is former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Michelle Fournoy. Um, before I go on to AI and China and a lot of other things you've been writing so brilliantly about, I want to ask you about this public criticism now. He described uh, Bibi Netanyahu, he's known for a long time, as you know, decades, and the government, especially Ben Gabir, the uh, national security minister, as being difficult, as not wanting a two-state solution, um, as not doing enough to protect civilian lives even though he says, you know, Hamas is the terrorist, and he's, you know, obviously acknowledges that up front, and they're using people as human shields, but that there has to be a way to avoid this kind of, um, these kind of casualties. I think, I mean, part of this is clearly that we stood alone in the United Nations Security Council mm -hmm. in vetoing a ceasefire resolution, standing with Israel on that, and it's going to happen again in the General Assembly later today. Right. But, you know, I think Biden, what, President Biden was um, remarkable in going to Israel, showing extremely strong support, and I think he had bipartisan support in Congress doing that. Um, but I think as the civilian casualties have mounted, um, there's, you know, the, the discussions behind closed doors have now become more, more public. I mean, Israel's in a very difficult situation because Hamas, you know, launched these horrific attacks. They feel they can't live with Hamas next door. They've got to degrade or destroy them. But Hamas, as a, ta as a strategy, hides in civilian infrastructure, hides the civilian population. Um, and so it's a very difficult task. Nevertheless, international law, you know, says you have to do your absolute, your utmost to try not to target civilians. And I think, I think I'm guessing that the administration's concern, certainly my concern, is that as more and more Palestinian civilians are killed, you know, Israel may destroy Hamas or degrade them seriously, but they're going to lose all international support. That is the real risk here, is that they win the battle and lose the war and become, a, you know, an isolated uh, state, which is not in, not in their interests at all. And further radicalize the population and the younger people, the hospital, hitting the hospitals and the siege, denying fuel, fuel and, right. and food. Right. And, and you've got to, you are, you know, Israel is responsible for creating those humanitarian corridors, those opportunity to get aid in to the population, even as they're relentlessly pursuing Hamas. You've got to be able to do both at the same time. And I think, again, uh, you know, when you hear Jake Sullivan and President Biden expressing this frustration publicly, it's because they actually care about Israel's future. They want to see a resolution to this ultimately that will allow Israel to live in peace and provide a homeland for the Palestinian people. Now, speaking of the future, I want to ask you about the article that you wrote in Foreign Affairs, because it's, it is really provocative in that you analyze the discrepancy between us and the other superpower, China, in our approach to AI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you talk about them beating us technologically, uh, partly because of their economic model with, and political model. It's a dictatorship. You know, they could just, you know, command and dictate that our advantage is a market economy with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, creativity and, and open society. But right now, they seem to be gaining an edge on us. Right. How do we, you know, we don't want to change our our political model. Right. How do we catch up? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we do have the world's greatest innovation ecosystem, hands down. Um, they have a lot of resources, people, money uh, to throw at the problem, and it's state directed. So they have that as an advantage. I wouldn't change the American hand for the Chinese hand, you know, at all. paid me a zillion dollars. But we have to play our hand well. And that means we don't have an innovation problem. Um, we, are, we have the lead on AI and all kinds of AI areas, uh, particularly those that matter to national security. But we have an innovation adoption problem, meaning the Pentagon and the government writ large is we're not a good customer. We put up so many barriers to the acquisition and integration of new technologies. So we really have a number of reforms that we need to make to move with speed, but also responsibly to make sure that AI, the AI we do use for national security is safe and secure. A slightly different edge to this. Does it worry you that we are so reliant for our national security on the launch and satellite technology of one 
person and one yes. entrepreneur, Elon and, Musk. And we don't have high altitude launches. We can't get our right. satellites up without him. We we don't have, you know, the communications right. satellite that is helping Ukraine. And now right. Bibi Netanyahu wants that also for Israel yeah. and Gaza. I mean, whatever you think of Elon Musk aside, mm -hmm. the United States military and society should not be depending on a, a prim, you know, one or, you know, primary provider. Part of having resilience in space is having multiple launch uh, providers. It's having uh, distributed uh, satellites. It's having the ability to quickly launch, you know, in a conflict or a crisis, if you lost capability, that you could quickly launch to replace it. And that is the vision that both NASA and the Space Force are pursuing. Um, but again, some of the challenge is barriers to acquisition, barriers to actually realizing that that vision with speed and scale. Um, but I do think people people are working on that because we don't want to be beholden to one company. You know, even in Ukraine, he said, well, I'm not sure about, you know, how whether I'd make Starlink available in other situations. We can't be in that position. We have to have multiple options to have that resilience that we need.